Hello guys and welcome to the latest episode of the MSC Performance Podcast. Uh, today it is myself and Mr. Luke Rogers that will be uh, will be taking you through a few bits. Um, how are we doing Luke, alright? Yeah, I'm good, I'm good. I'm looking forward to this one. A bit more uh, training based again, which is uh, exciting now as things start to, to reopen, which is cool. Um, so yeah, getting excited to talk about training again and, and getting people ready for six weeks time, which is cool. Absolutely. So yeah, today's podcast is, um, as Luke says, yeah, very sort of training, training based. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about two subjects. Um, one subject, um, well, in fact, both subjects sort of came about really with the last Q and A that we did, um, and also a Q and A I did on Instagram. And obviously, it's quite hard to go into too much depth with sort of 15 second video clips so we can just expand on these a little bit more um, but the two areas we're going to focus on are the trap bar deadlift versus the conventional barbell deadlift and the second subject we're going to discuss is accommodating resistance so the use of bands and chains in your training so we'll crack on without further ado um, so yeah, with the with the trap bar versus conventional deadlift, this was a, a question I got on my on my personal Instagram um, when I was doing the Q and A, and it was a really good question. So the question was along the lines of, with with such a long off season, why are you choosing trap bar as opposed to uh, conventional? And not necessarily talk about it from a preseason rugby perspective, but we're just going to go into a little bit more depth on why you might use uh, sort of one over the other. So for me personally. Um, I absolutely love the barbell deadlift. Like I think, you know, it's it's arguably my favourite movement actually in terms of just the enjoyment I get from it. But in the last couple of years, especially, I've moved more to trap bar, and I tend to use that more with uh, more with my uh, training for for various reasons that we'll uh, we'll, we'll discuss. Um, so, what what about you, Luke? Obviously, from a powerlifting perspective, obviously a third of the sport is the barbell deadlift. So obviously that's going to be the main yeah. main movement. But do you do you utilize the trap bar in your own training and with clients? So not not massively, if I'm honest. Not not, not least with powerlifters. Um, we spoke in the last podcast about like during the off season training, uh, choosing exercises that are better suited towards like hypertrophy and also variations of exercises, which will probably be a good thing for avoiding injury and repetitive. Mm -hmm use injuries um but that said i don't think i've ever given a powerlifter a trap bar deadlift um <clears throat> i train a couple of field sport athletes and they pretty much all year round do some variation of a trap bar deadlift as opposed to a conventional deadlift so with with general populations if they love deadlifting like you, like you just said i would give them a, a conventional deadlift or sumo whatever they would like to do um but if they're not like massively attached to doing a deadlift i'd, I'd always lean towards a trap bar deadlift and then using more of like a, a hingy deadlift, like a like an RDL or, or an exercise, it's probably a little bit easy to perform. So I'm not massive on the trap bar for powerlifters, but um, but for general populations, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think with general pop and from a field athlete point of view as well. Uh, so for me personally, I like to use uh, the trap bar deadlift um, and then use the, the barbell uh, Romanian deadlift. Um, you know, if I'm looking to get to sort of big hinge uh, movements in uh, per week um you know i think that 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 suits me really well um and yeah similar to yourself i think with general pop like if if they really prefer a, a conventional deadlift then they can perform the movement well and safely and effectively um you know it's arguably you know well it is, it is a little bit you know more technical there's a few more uh sort of you know points to to think about and you know your, your setup's obviously a little bit different requires you know, touch more mobility, touch more thinking. So as long as they can do that, you know, well and safely, then, you know, absolutely mm. uh, crack on. Um, I think from, uh, you know, I'll, I'll angle this naturally more towards a field athlete uh, point of view, I think, but, you know, this obviously works for general pop as well. Um, but in terms of the, the studies that have been, uh, have been done, uh, there's one in particular um, from uh, Lake et al, which is the effect of a hexagonal, uh, hexagonal barbell on the mechanical deadlift, uh, on uh, sorry, the mechanical demand of deadlift performance uh, back in 2017, and this was a this was a really interesting uh, study that showed some very um, sort of preferable results for for using the trap bar. And again, you know, we're not we're not saying the trap bar is better than the 
the, the conventional barbell deadlift, but there was a few, you know, there was a little bit of food for, for thoughts here. And um, so, for example, you know, some of the, some of the statistics that I've had to write down because I can't remember them all. Um, but in terms of um, the subjects that we use, they, it's important to know they were well-trained. Um, and obviously well-trained can be quite, quite broad, but uh, basically what it showed is the average lifter uh, could lift 6% more weight with a trap bar than they could with the conventional deadlift at top end strength. Um, they could lift that 15% more velocity at 90% of their one rep max, which I thought was a really interesting to, uh, statistic and overall produced 28% more higher output, uh, higher power output. So that, that, that for me is quite interesting. So you're talking 6% <clears throat> 6 more weight, 15% more velocity at high percentages at 90% and then 28% higher power output. Um, which is I presume this is uh, I, I can't remember the study exactly off my head I read it a while back but I, I presume it is comparing the same high handles because with the, the hex bar or the trap bar you get the option between a higher handle or a low handle I presume in this it was comparing the same height so it would have been off the low handles it was because I think handles, if you did it off, yeah. yeah if you did it off high handles that that number of six percent would be so much higher but comparing well, the low handles that, that's another interesting uh, <clears throat> topic within this actually is the is the height of the handles yeah and the study the study was exactly the same uh, level so yeah you know if, as, as a good point you've brought up because you know some people might be thinking well the handles are a bit higher and there's less range of movement yeah this is exact this is based on exactly the same uh, range, of, range of movement so you know it's a you know it's quite quite interesting and with those with those stats um you know and that there has been you know other other research done into this as well and we're going to go into like you know effects on other bits and pieces as well but you know there's quite a strong argument there for for using it for um a, a field athlete now with the uh height of the handles as well obviously that can change things and as you as you've just said you know, they can change it quite significantly. So for, for me, for example, um, you know, the last sort of, you know, the last sort of two or three years, I've been using a higher handle trap bar deadlift. So, you know, sort of, you know, a few inches above um, off the floor uh, compared to where a normal deadlift would be. And the difference between my max trap bar and my max barbell deadlift is, is more than 6%. It's quite yeah. significant. So the proof's in the pudding there. Um, so my top trap bar to put it in um, perspective is 290 kilos um, and my top barbell deadlift is 240 so I'm not going to work out the the percentage 20% yeah it's, yeah 20%. No, it's, well there you go yeah so it's 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 a uh, you know yeah 20% compared to 6% so you know the height of handles makes a big difference um, you know the anthropometrics of the the athlete makes a makes a difference as well um a big failing point for me with the conventional deadlift was always off the floor um so sort of go into the the trap bar um and th this study also shows which is quite interesting that at the, at the same height um there was a you know there was a recommendation that if you're struggling off the floor with the the conventional deadlift even at the same height with a with a with a trap bar um you know due to the extra bit of knee flexion you know and, and sort of quad work that can that can really carry over nicely if you if you struggle off the floor of the conventional moving over to trap bar uh can you know actually transfer quite quite nicely across uh i've gone from higher handle trap bar into conventional before and found no carryover yeah which backs up the study which talks about you know at, at lower end um, <clears throat> you know the start of the movement off the floor there's a big carryover in the mid range there's like zero practically there's a, a couple of good points from there that I, I like to, to quote about. And the, the one is for like a field sport perspective. You said on a conventional, you fell completely off the floor. I think that's quite uncommon, actually. And for most people, yeah. I would say that normally with a conventional deadlift, it would, it would break off the floor. They'd probably get stuck around mid-shin um, if, they're, if they hold good positioning. If not, they'd probably get stuck around knee height, maybe just above the knee. But the point yeah. is that there's a de the, the bar deaccelerates at some point through the sticking point of the conventional deadlift. Compared to the trap bar deadlift, when you talk about like the power output and the, the speed output, there's no deacceleration component to the trap bar deadlift. Mm -hmm. Once it breaks the floor, you, you, unless you lost balance, you're, you're going to get the lift. Yeah. Um, so like in terms of like for a force output or a power output perspective, choosing the trap bar over the conventional deadlift, like you said, you've already gave us the stats, but that's like the little proof of it. If, if your goal was completely power output, 
you would choose the trap bowl all day because the amount of force and the amount of power you're going to produce is so much better. And you don't want to be slowing down when your aim is to produce maximal power. So it makes sense to choose the trap bowl over the, over the conventional for that reason. Yeah. The second point I really liked is about, you say about the, how you can manipulate the position while well, with a conventional deadlift because the bar's out in front of you, you're always going to have that very hingy pattern and it doesn't suit everyone. Not everyone can get into a good conventional position without finding themselves in a, in a comprehended position where it could lead to an issue. Uh, but with the trap bar, trap bar deadlift, there's so much more flexibility to choose a position that suits you. So if you find that being like really horizontal with a, hurts your lower back or you find it uncomfortable, you can go for that more forward knee, slightly more for a squattier pattern, uh, which you can't do with a conventional deadlift. If you were trying to re replicate that with the conventional, you'd set yourself up super upright, knees forward. You'd pull the bar because the weight's not through your center mass. Your hips would shoot up. Your shoulders would come over the bar before it would break. You'd find yourself in the same position. So if you really hate that position, being able to pull from the floor with good volume, uh, the trap bar would allow you to do that and to manipulate the position to, to what suits you or also what you want to work on, I guess. Yeah. I mean, from, yeah, if, if, you put, if we put our coaching heads <clears> on now, you know, I think you'd probably agree with me with a, with a trap bar deadlift. You know, if you're getting your general pop guys in um, and, 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 and your athletes to an extent, um, <clears throat> I think you can pretty much coach anyone to be able to perform a, a respectable trap bar deadlift in, in regards yeah. to te technique within five minutes. <laughs> I mean, you know, whether that's, you know, maybe using the higher handles or, you know, wh whatever it is, it's a, it's a very easy movement to, to learn uh, for most people. And the barbell deadlift is obviously more, more technical. Like you say, you know, bar being out in front of you does shift the set, you know, the, the center of mass slightly. It does become a little bit more hinge. And then as the bar's traveling up, we've got to be very careful with our positioning. If the hips shoot up too high, you know, then obviously it becomes even more hingy and even more, <clears throat> you know, even, even, even more strain, strain through, you know, in and around the hip and, you know, lower back and, and glutes. But, you know, the bar can swing out in front of you ever so slightly in that takes you know even that centimeter or two outside of the center of mass is going to increase is going to increase the load um massively especially when you get to a good level and you you know we've seen it you know down at msc coaching coaching powerlifters as they get you know as they get to a good level is you know even more important because the the, the margins are, are finer you know with the yeah. with the weight with the weight going up you know uh, you you know for, for yourself if you you know somebody who's obviously very technically astute at the, at the movement now but if you're ever so slightly out of position at a 80 80 percent plus load you're going to feel the effects of that aren't you and your top top end there's a good chance of you failing the, the lift and you'll you'll see quite often like someone will try and deadlift the normal mass just stop um if they've got it slightly wrong they'll know if they've got it slightly wrong off the floor i see it quite a lot of times people are like so oh, I felt the bar go away and rather than grinding it, I just dropped it because that's the problem with the conventional as well is it's the risk to reward um, isn't quite there because if there's that little bit of technical breakdown, especially if you're predispositioned to lower back injuries, that bar comes away ever so slightly. You find yourself, like you said, the moment arms increase, your back goes into that little bit of flexion. And if you can't tolerate that position, then the chances of getting injured are so high. Well, with the, with the trap bar, it's, it's through the center of mass there's a little bit of deviation that can happen, but nowhere near to the same, uh, same level as, as, a, as a conventional. But yeah, like you said, um, yeah, it's, there's so much more technical breakdown that can happen during the lift. Um, you see people just drop it if, if, if it does get tough, knowing they've made a mistake. Um, yeah, I absolutely. think with the, uh, with the coaching, I think, like you said, the, the most logical progressive plan that we would use would be get people in the trap by their lift because there are a lot of transferable skills from it you're still pulling from the floor you still got to arrange your back into a good position you've still got to brace under lowered uh, and then taking that there into like an rdl and if you can perform an rdl getting used to keeping the bar nice and close to your leg bracing and keeping your back in a good position then going into the conventional deadlift, you've got the mobility, you've learned how to brace, you've learned how to lift heavy load from the from the floor, and then getting into the conventional makes complete sense, I think. Yeah, you're sort of almost reverse engineering the movement, aren't you? And yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I agree completely, and um, not to diverse too much into RDL, but I think that's <clears> one, of the, one of the most sort of underused, and um, not even underused, but under, um, what's the word I'm looking for, sort of, you know, not, not enough, focus is put on to loading, it, yeah. loading a good RDL. Um, yeah. In my opinion, it's often used for 
um, you know, accessory work at, you know, sixes, eights, tens, which is fine. There's no, no dramas yeah. with that at all, but you know, top end, you know, top end RDL strength. Um, is that something, is that something uh, you'd use with your, uh, powerlifters and, and would measure? Um, if, if, yeah, not it's, it's, if not testing, but like building up to triples and sort of saying, right, you should be doing X amount of triples or for, for an RDL. Sure. I think with because the RDL lends itself to being more range of motion through the hip, I'd probably lend it more to being like a higher rep exercise. I've probably yeah. gone as low as like fours or fives, but typically would be between that like five to eight range because I think it lends itself to be better for hypertrophy. You're getting that time of detention with the controlled eccentric, full yeah. range of motion through the hip. So I think it makes more sense as a hypertrophy exercise for powerlifter where their main movement is going to be mm. a normal deadlift. But an interesting one is I'm sure maybe I've got a couple of clients that are like super things and I just can't see they can't RDL. Um, they're really bad at hinging. And I just think that the correlation between able to do a good hinge under good load and like lower back discomfort, hip discomfort, there's a massive correlation there. So if even if like you can't do an RDL that heavy, like your ability to actually perform the movement under load and building that up is, is massive. So it's something that we use as like, I'd say injury preventative and also from a hypertrophy perspective, we use it a lot. Not really working up to heavy threes and fours. If I wanted to do that, I'd go for a stiff leg deadlift probably, which would yeah. be... It's a bit more, um, um, bit, bit more it's this, you know, it's a bit more similarity with the... Yeah, it's the same pattern as an RDL, but yeah, from the floor, it's a little bit easy to, to measure. Because I think I'm a bit like uh, like if you did a bench press and not twitching your chest, like with the RDL, it lends itself to maybe making a couple of reps cheating. I, I've tried to, I had a goal of like 200 for eight on an RDL, I think it was. And like after six reps and it's getting tough, all of a sudden your range yeah. is getting slightly shorter. You're getting a bit sloppy with the eccentric. So I think mm. it lends itself to be not as consistent. Well, with a stiff leg deadlift, if it's on the floor every time, Yes, you can drop your hips down a touch, but I think it lends itself to be a bit more consistent through the yeah. reps. Especially if you're coaching as well. That's a very easy one, the, you know, the stiff leg deadlift to, you know, get that, get your client's hip position in exactly the right place exactly, yeah. before the lift. Yeah. I think, yeah, the, um, I said we weren't going to diverge into the RDL, but we have, uh, you know, we'll carry on with it. But uh, yeah, I think like in terms of hypertrophy, yeah, it's ab absolutely fantastic exercise, like you say, because of the eccentric loading. You know, you know, we know about you know muscle fiber recruitment through eccentric loading, through the time under tension as well. Um, yeah. With uh, you know, with 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 that, you know, so it's, it's you know, it's a big uh, big big movement. Um, and so yeah, you get you get everything. You know, you get low time under tension, eccentric loading. You know, three fantastic things for uh, for building muscle mass. Um, and then that's really interesting actually with the um, going into the lower rep, higher load. Um, that makes complete sense from a from a powerlifting uh, point of point of view, um, and then from a field athlete point of view, that is something that you'd you'd look to load up and and hit your triples and your fours and your fives and load up quite heavy as well. Obviously, you would be using it as a higher rep movement, lower load uh, to begin with because it's a very fine margin with the RDL. It's very easy to cheat or to lose shape, lose form um, at the heavier loads, but yeah, I really like with my like with my field athlete guys to to build up to like real heavy sort of fours and threes. And like I say, it might not be doing that with the barbell, don't they? <clears throat> and then you'd be using it with the trap bar. So you know, your two hinge movements with your lower body yeah, might, yeah. might be trap bar RDL. Because I because think one of the problems with go on. No, that's right. Yeah, yeah. No, I was, I was remember that. That's fine. One of one of the problems I think powerlifters have is, is setting these predetermined numbers on stuff like an RDL. Um, and using it as like, oh, well, by the end of this cycle, I'm going to do 183. And because they're focusing so much on that, they've just lost the actual benefit of the exercise, which is, like you said, full range of motion, control, time and attention. And all of a sudden, they're just doing these like really bastardized RDLs that look terrible, but it's yeah. to chase this number. And I think that's like one of the downfalls of yeah. the movement um, from a powerlifting perspective, rather than just thinking, right, I'm trying to get good time and attention, good range through the hip. And I will load it appropriately for what I'm trying to do. I think people lose that because powerlifting is very like quantitative. You're trying to chase a number, and sometimes you can lose that and, and take it sure. too far. You um, you know, if you, yeah, if you're pushing to that that extent and you're increasing risk factors, you you may <clears> as well be you may as well be deadlifting, and yeah. at least improving the the movement that's a you know a, th a third of the sport, you know, basically. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, that's really, really interesting. I think, um, you know, I mean, I think the, if, if we want to sort of con 
conclude and sort of wrap this uh, wrap this up a little bit um, in terms of trap bar versus conventional. I mean, as as always, um, the the devil's in the details, as uh, Mr. Yep. Max Hartman would say, and it's very much dependent on the individual um, on the sport or the desired outcome um and with the individual it's preference it's um you know i mean look if someone comes you know if someone comes in like with the barbell club you know we'll often you know give a give a choice between the trap bar and the and the conventional and if someone really wants to push a conventional deadlift and hit numbers we're gonna we're gonna push them to do that um you know it depends on the anthropometrics of the athlete skill of the athlete um you know, and there's uh, and also various other factors as to what else you're doing in your in your program and what the what the goals yeah. are. Um, so, really, you know, to to answer the question is it depends, and it's all about the context. Um, if anyone fancies a twelve hour read, you can uh, catch my blog on, uh, on 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 our website about that. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, we sometimes I wish we could say right, this is better or that's better. Yeah, um, and maybe you know, our life would be more simple, but, you know, I think it really, it's good when you have these conversations. It really does depend. When you have these conversations and you say it depends, it's not like you just say, it, oh, it depends. And that's like the cool answer to say, at least you're giving people information and then they can make the decision themselves based off everything that they know. So you're still getting good takeaways from it because I think the answer is always going to be depends, but as long as you're getting some information regarding like the trap bar versus the conventional, then you can make your own decision based off everything you've learned. That's okay. I'm going to throw one more spanner into the work. Uh, right. Greg Knuckles talks about um, the trap bar deadlift being a great exercise for sumo deadlifters uh, because like with a sumo, the bar doesn't deaccelerate once it's lifted if you hold good positions. Um, the joint angles are fairly similar at the knee because it's a slightly more squatier pattern compared to the conventional. So actually the joint mechanics are very similar. I know it's like, like looking at it from a straight on perspective. Um, but like the knee angle is different, so similar, the hip angle is similar, there's no deacceleration, so it can be a good exercise for sumo pullers. And if like you wanted them to do some kind of hinge pattern to complement their sumo, if you didn't want to do conventional or RDL, trap bar could be good for them. Yeah, that's nice. I think uh, there you go. from a, yeah, if you're picturing it now from a side on, you know, looking side on, then yeah, very, very similar, uh, very similar setup. Um, yeah, I mean, we didn't go too much into sort of, you know, cheering forces on the lower back and things like that but i think that's pretty obvious with you know what we're talking about in terms of the bar being out in front slightly with a conventional deadlift and you know the um you know is it, it could be quite easy if you're not well skilled to lose position of the bar and for it to come forward and therefore you know increase the you know in, in, increase the the load yeah um, i think we did clear that and i think like just to from a that's to reiterate that with the general populations, the benefit is, is that the weight is evenly distributed through your centre mass, which lends it to be an easier lift compared yeah. to the conventional, which is out in front. And like Mark said, if the bar goes out in front, or even if it doesn't, if it stays super tight to your legs, the moment arm is longer on the lower back than when it would be on the, on the trap bar, because the weight is directly through your centre mass. And it just will never be on the, uh, on the conventional, because the bar is always going to be out in front of you. And that makes it a difficult lift in its own, in its own right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, to round, yeah, to round up, sort of, you know, pick which one you want, uh, you know, make an informed decision based on, um, you know, on the, on the facts that are there. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, as I say, you know, if, you, if, if you're a, a field athlete or, um, you know, general, general pop and, you, you know, and, and you're looking at both those movements, you know, trap bar is going to be probably slightly easier to, um, to set up. Um, as Luke says, you know, it's, you, you know, the trap, you know, trap bars within the center of your mass, you've got some of the weight in front behind with the bar, the shape of the bar, and obviously, you know, the weights on the side. So it's very easy to keep that in the center of uh, your mass. Um, you know, the, the statistics show from, uh, from, the, from the data, you know, there's, you know, the potential, and we always have to say potential because everybody's different, uh, to lift, um, you know, slightly more weight of the study showing, you know, 6% more weight. 15% more velocity and 90%, 28% higher power output. So if you're a rugby player, for example, you know, um, most rugby players are pretty broken and, you know, don't get into great positions and have a lot of load through the, through the lower back and the hip region throughout the season, especially, um, you know, run, you know, the amount of mileage, the amount of contacts, everything like that. 
then you know you might say look you know especially in season let's just load up a trap bar you know and especially when you're a well-trained um athlete and your strength base is good enough um you know then again just for a slightly biased sort of rugby point of view once your strength base is at a good level you know obviously you always want to train train you know sort of maximal maximal strength you know at least you sort of you know 75 80 percent even in season for minimal volume um but you know the important thing then is you know rate of force development how how quickly you can move those sub maximal percentages you know how fast you can move that that kind of that kind of weight anywhere between your 30 to 80 percent and then lower end obviously we're talking a bit more maximal speed but um so you know loading up like i've said you know even the, the data shows there at 90 percent to be able to lift quicker you know so doing loads in season you're you know you know 60 percent 70 percent 80 percent you know you're potentially going to be able to lift a little bit quicker it's going to be less shearing forces through the lower back um you know and you're gonna you know probably get a bit more bang for your buck having said that there's certainly still a place for uh for the for the barbell deadlift um you know we didn't really go into sort of too much about sort of you know potential trophy of the, the hamstrings and glutes posterior chain a little bit more um you know um and you know obviously there's, there's various advantages from a powerlifting point of view as luke said you know, it's obviously a lot, you know, the deadlift's a lot more specific and you might not really use the trap bar too much. Um, if you general pop, choose which one you like and just, you know, take all that into consideration, really, I think. Anything else to add to that, mate? Or I think the, I would say back, back onto powerlifting to, to reiterate that if you, if you want, like you said, strength is specific to the angles that you train. So if you want to do a trap bar, like you said from the study, just make sure you're doing the, the lower handle version. Um, or maybe like a, a hybrid between the two. So you're like using a block to make it not the super high handles because the carryover is not going to be as good. Sure. Um, uh, I would also say that if you're, yeah, if you're a general population and you've never done any resistance training, then the best place to start would be the trap bar deadlift. After you've learned to do a hinge with like a dumbbell or a kettlebell, the trap bar would probably be better than the conventional just to learn how to arrange yourself into position and how to brace under load and then use that progressive system that we spoke about, about eventually getting into doing the conventional deadlift. But I think that covers everything. I think we're, well, not everything, but I think it covers a lot of good info. So good. Nice one. Fantastic. Right, we'll move, uh, move on to our sort of second topic for the day, uh, which was accommodating resistance. Um, so... We did get a question on this on uh, our last Q and A, and we covered it in the podcast uh, a little bit. Uh, we're just going to go into a little bit more uh, detail on it. So, um, for those who aren't uh, familiar, accommodating resistance, we're talking about use of bands and chains. Uh, they can be used for maximal strength. They can be used for explosive strength or power. Um, they can be used for even for hypertrophy or even stability work. Um, so, you know, the the theory behind it essentially, we're all you know the Obviously, we're adding adding extra resistance to the bar, um, but we're looking at uh, basically adding a greater resistance towards the top end of the of the lift where the strength is greater. Um, you know, conversely, obviously, there's less you know there's there's less resistance in the bottom portion of the lift. So basically, if we think if we take a, a squat for example with with bands, okay, as we're coming up through the lift through the concentric phase, okay, normally obviously we're accelerating. But we've got the resistance of the band increasing to to slow us slow us down essentially. So we've got to basically try and accelerate uh, through the through the accommodating resistance of the uh, of, of the band. Um, so with bands and chains, is that something you you have used much, Luke, in powerlifting and also for general pop? <clears throat> so I like them, but not probably for the reason that we're going to talk about now. I like a banded. Um, a banded squat every so often for people that, that descend too slow and we just want to get them to, to be a bit more confident on the descent because I think that the difference between the bands and the chains is that the band actively pulls you down uh, while the chain's just kind of like the dead weight the band pulls you down when it's at its max tension so it encourages you to, to descend faster so that can be a pro and a con if someone's very erratic on their descent then adding a band onto it it's going to be carnage but if someone's like super slow and you're trying to get you, you think they're wasting energy or they're just not as efficient on that descent as the one if you wanted them to descend a little bit faster potentially putting a band on there could help them pull down a little bit quicker 
Uh, so it's not always a positive, but it can be used for people that, that you want to descend a touch, a touch faster. Aside from that, I'm for, from a exclusively powerlifting, you're going to talk field sports, so I'll let you talk field sports. From a powerlifting perspective, I, I don't use them at all, to be honest. Um, the reason in being is that, like with the strength curve, like you said, you it overloads a part of the movement that it doesn't particularly matter because you're only going to miss the the lift at the weakest portion that you have. So with the squat, once you're out the hole, it doesn't matter if you get stronger out the hole. Um, it only matters where you're weakest. So I'm not sure if adding a band to improve the amount of force you're producing at the top is, is a beneficial thing because you're just still going to miss at that bottom position. So I'd rather spend extra time getting as strong as we can at that bottom position rather than adding extra load at the top. I'm not sure if there's a negative to doing that, but I'm just... I would just much rather use exercises that are based purely around building up that bottom strength rather than using that extra effort at the top. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, the name of the game in powerlifting is, you know, you're not really <clears> necessarily <throat> looking to increase, you know, power output of those, uh, of those top, top ranges either, are you? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like if I, I mean, another thing to think about is that like if you're doing, let's say you're doing 80% for four reps with a band. So it's, it's quite easy at the hole, but then it gets hard at the top. Um, rather than like keeping the RPE down and, and repeating that same amount of effort, you're probably going to reach a higher RPE. And it's a higher RPE about work that's not going to improve your position that's weakest. Mm. So I'm not sure how much benefit it would have is making parts harder that don't need to be harder. Yeah. Um, and with, with a powerlifting thing, the, the, the whole accommodating resistance came from like West Side Barbell and, and, and the conjugate style of training, which is equipped lifting, where the yeah. equipment gives so much assistance out the hole that then you get stuck at the top part of the lift. Sure. And that's why they use like boards, they use chains to overload that part of the lift, which you actually need to help with. Because with you, you watch people with the bench and it's like they're pulling the bar down as hard as they can. And then the, 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 the the, the bench um, shirt, it assists you to halfway, then you've got to just finish the second half by yourself. So they're using the chains to overload that part, but that's not... Yeah, that was going to be my next point. Yeah. Yeah. That was going to be my next point was, yeah, I think a lot of people get confused with, Louis, you know, obviously Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell has popularised that and, um, you know, it was, uh, originated from uh, Russia, actually, the use of, use of the combinated resistance, but Louis yeah. Simmons obviously popularised it. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's different, isn't it? And I think a lot of people, you know, this, you know, they've, they've read a bit of West Side Barbell and they sort of think, oh, you know, bands chains and even the speed day, all this sort of stuff, but they don't take into consideration the difference, um, you know, between, between equipped and non-equipped in, in powerlifting. Yeah. It's funny because like the speed day is, is kind of coming back, but it just gets rephrased each time. But absolutely, it's, it's the same with like the laps in the bench press. Like we know they're not a pro mover, but everyone talks about like, oh, I need to get my laps stronger to improve my bench. And besides that's like, a, a, besides keeping yourself in a good position, I, <laughs> the laps don't really do anything. But I was like, oh, I need to improve my chin up because I think it'll improve my bench. And I'm just not sure it will. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you want to improve your bench, bench. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a classic classic lifter you're pretty much going to get stuck in the hole on the squat off the chest or just a couple of inches off on the bench press and then at the deadlift mid chin I do actually use if anything out of the three I do use a banded deadlift quite a lot actually um, because I use that on a secondary day and the reason is is because I think with the squat there's less you'll see what I'm saying like for someone that flexes their back on the deadlift um, putting the band at the top it really really like encourages them to keep a better position off the floor yeah. Uh, yeah. Because if you flex, if you flex out your spine to be super fast off the floor, and you get to that knee, you're out of position. You're having to extend the back, extend the hips, and you've got extra resistance coming off. It's fucking horrible. If someone's like slightly flexes over or loses position, forcing them to be super strict to keep the tension off the floor, it, it really encourages them to hold that position better. Yeah. So I do actually use a banded deadlift quite a lot. I like it. I like for powerlifting for the for the same reasons actually. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and it's funny because we just bought three uh, deadlift platforms as well, actually, that have uh, fan pegs on them. Have we? Nice oh, right. That. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Completely yeah. forgot about that. Yeah, something for our, uh, for our members to look forward to when we get back. <laughs> um, nice bit of stash. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, I talked at the beginning about you know, people who use them for max strength, power, and then obviously other bits and pieces as well. But I've, I've never actually used bands or chains for top end strength no i just don't like the idea of it and like the actual main reason is i just think it's unsafe <laughs> like if you're loading up like you know 
sort of 85 90 percent on a back squat and then you're adding chains on top as well the instability of mm. chains and just taking the bar out walking it out you know the the chances of rotational sort of force yeah. through, through the hip if the ch- if, i just if, don't if, like if the- it i just think it's unnecessary yeah, with the change, if the links lie slightly different, you can definitely feel like asymmetries. The band's a little bit easy because it's pulling directly down. Sure, but with sure. the change, if it, if it, if they don't lie exactly the same either side, it can become a little uncomfortable. It can be horrible, yeah. 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 Which, you yeah. know, for a well-trained person, it may be 50 to 70% yeah. is going to be fine, isn't it? But oh, God, it, yeah, yeah. I just really don't like the, the use of them at top-end strength. Uh, much prefer the lower percentages and and obviously doing my booty, booty band workouts as well. That's a... The big, the big thing for me is like, like at eighty five percent is just making it a harder lift that's not going to be beneficial to what you're trying to do. So, if you would have done eighty for four reps, eighty percent for four reps, and it would have been a six RPE, let's say, with a normal, you add the bands, and then all of a sudden it's going to be a seven or an eight RPE. Going into your next set, your actual output at the position that you're weakest is going to be a little bit higher, probably. Um, even if it's not that part that's overloading, your overall fatigue is going to be a bit higher. So actually, then your amount of force you're going to produce out the hole is going to be less than if you've just done it so the amount of work you're getting that's going to ben- benefit your your classic squat is, is going to be less but you're going to get more load at the top end which i'm not sure how much benefit it would have yeah um if things change when you talk about like you said power speed and when you talk about field sports athletes or people that aren't specifically trying to get strong at a squat but just get strong overall through all ranges of motion so you know, in a, a rugby player doesn't need to get strong at that really deep position of a squat, but he might want to get really strong at the top end when he's fully extended. So for someone like that, from a, a, a power output perspective, it could be useful. And I use accommodating resistance a lot with, with like field athletes. Great. I was, yeah, that, was, that leads perfectly on to, on to my next uh, sort of question or discussion point actually was, like, you know, we've probably cleared up there uh, very thoroughly, you know, its, uh, it's use in terms of power lifters. Um, and uh, I, I agree completely in terms of obviously you do train a few field athletes as well um, and as you've, as you've said there you, you sort of favour favor the use of those before I go into a few, few bits do you want to expand on that? Um, yeah sure so like, like your, experience, uh, like, your experiences and sort of you know, reasons you'd use them yeah I think as soon as well, there's a couple of things I think as soon as you had chains or bands on something it, it, it gives people extra incentive to move them quick yeah. Because it looks cool, yeah, you've yeah. got the noise of it. So if you're trying to get someone to produce maximal force and you're giving them 80% for a set of three or four and you'd say, move this as quickly as you can, like sometimes the incentive just isn't there. With the yeah. bands of the chains, I think just from a... It's fun, it's fun. You, <laughs> it's fun, it is fun. Uh, it looks cool. Um, yeah. So people just all, automatically go into the sets with a bit more focus, probably trying to produce more force. For, and that can be massive. Like it's just a little thing, but it's, it's massive. Um, like we said, with, with a field sport, like it doesn't matter how strong you're in that bottom position. You just want to be kind of strong for all joint ranges of motion. So yeah. like adding a bit of extra weight at the top end is a great thing to do because that's where you spend a lot of your time extending. Um, so stuff like that can be fantastic. Um, I, I think the main thing is just like the focus going into the sets and then also just getting strong full ranges of motion. And then like you said, from a force and power perspective, I think the research indicates that it is a lot more uh, beneficial to use accommodating resistance versus straight weight. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's been uh, backed up, um, you know, in the in the rugby field by Dan Baker as well, who's one of the primary researchers in uh, rugby S and C. Um, you know, and a lot of you know his his research has, has shown you know both faster eccentric uh, contractions as well, which is important to to think about, and concentric contractions with the use of bands and chains as opposed to uh, equal weight with just a just a straight bar um you know and uh there's there's ton, there's there's tons of research which you know has backed up what you know what we've been saying there um and uh yeah i think the the, the mental aspect is you know i agree i agree with that you know you, you talk about you know we talk about intent a lot don't we with uh with, with speed and power work and you know, getting a, you know, getting a field athlete and set right, you know, band and chain work, band and chain, you know, it can just be that little bit of extra fun, that little bit of extra incentive to, right, you've got to push against this band as hard, hard as you can. Um, and for, for speed work as well, a point that nobody ever really brings up, which I quite like, is actually a sort of safety aspect of using bands and chains, the fact that it is slowing you down slightly. Slowing you down at the top, right yeah. At the top end, so, you know, in terms of jolting and potentially hyperextending, 
um, you know, at uh, you know at the, at the top ends is is quite a it's a useful uh, little little add on to using uh, pans and pans and change as well. But yeah, very much so. I think the you know uh, strength, performance, power is very linked to joint angles as well and like the specificity of joint angles which i agree with we spoke about that with the trap bar and the the conventional of right you know with a with a power lifter that top handle trap you know trap bar isn't really gonna 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 carry over um and uh it works works the other way as well with field athletes yeah like you say it doesn't necessarily matter how strong we are in the bottom portion portion of that movement you know i'm never really going to be getting down into that sort of deep you know deep deep squat position but if i'm fast through that extension through that hip extension at top end when i'm when i'm coming into my into my contact you know i'm at a flex position in the hip and i'm coming into my contact and that's whether it's a tackle or whether it's a carry i'm coming into from a flex position into an extended and my and my flex position you know it's certainly not going to be from 90 degrees you know it's going to be from maybe 45 degrees upwards and yeah. I'm coming into hopefully a high velocity extension in, into that position. So really, if I if I can improve speed throughout that range from that 45 degrees into full extension, then I'm on the money really. You know, and I'm going to make a high impact. And yeah. you know, and, and uh, the the same is also true from a non contact point of view from sprinting and you know football and things like this as well. If I can improve you know that, that that speed and power through that that range that's going to help and you know the data would you know suggest very very strongly that accommodating resistance can can help with that i think that's a big one like you just said about uh it improving your speed on the on the eccentric as well and that kind of deaccelerative mm-hmm. component to it is, is massive for for mm-hmm. like carry over to like your jumps your landing and, and deaccelerating then re-accelerating that's yeah. massive so yeah Big, That's big huge time. for field sports. Yeah, big, big time, big time. I think like with, um, you know, in, in terms of injury, injury prevention, I don't really like using the term injury prevention, but like I'll, I'll use it for simplicity of what I'm about to explain. In terms of injury prevention, obviously, you know, we need good strength eccentrically. Um, you know, we, t- we, need to, we need to absorb forces really. You know, you see people get, injured on the on the sports field whether that's a non-contact sport like you know sprinting or a contact sport like rugby or american football you know we get we get injured you know because we can't absorb the the forces that you know we're not strong enough to um absorb the forces that we're undertaking in that sport so for a sprinter that might be someone who's producing very high uh, force and you know and, and high velocities through through sprinting very very fast um very high velocity which is obviously causing, you know, very, very, very high force. Sometimes when we think force velocity, we think force is just purely top end strength, but that's where the force velocity curves a little bit of perverse, really. But um, so sprinters are, co- you know, causing you know high forces. But if they don't have the strength to absorb those forces through eccentric strength for the hamstring, you know, through eccentric loading through the joints, and that's where the injuries happen. We see sprinters, you know, pull up with with hamstrings. Um, you know, hamstring injuries, see rugby players, football players especially doing it. Um, when I was a, a little bit younger and quicker, I tore my hamstring a couple of times and it's because I didn't have the, the, stre- the strength to absorb the, the speed in which I was running, which wasn't particularly quick, but I wasn't, I wasn't very strong. <laughs> um, so that's, that's important. And then when we're talking about eccentric strength, like your slow um, movements are very important. So slow eccentric work, um, Bearing in mind, it can be very taxing, but I can build good muscle muscle mass. I can build good control and good eccentric loading. So we're talking about heavy RDLs. We're talking about single leg, um, you know, deadlift, single leg RDL type movements, hinge patterns. But you know, and, and that's that's really important. But also, it is good to do your quicker eccentric work as as well. You know, and and using something like bands can improving that or increasing that that speed of the eccentric load and having the ability to control that and absorb that force can have a massive carryover into sport because field-based sport we obviously want to move quickly you know when we're sprinting when we're changing direction everything like that we're moving quickly so it's very good to have the slow 
the practice of slow eccentric work and, and technical low, you know, and heavy loads like that. But it's also good to have slightly lower loads, more dynamic movements, which is going to be very appropriate for, you know, for, for field based and, and track based work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we can probably round that up unless there's anything you want to add. I'll just round up that particular subject. No, I think like you said, I think we're, we're both in agreement that top end strength may maybe not there. From, we haven't really spoke about it from a hypertrophy perspective. And I think there's actually like, there is some okay research that says potentially adding accommodating resistance can be okay for, for hypertrophy. Um, it's, it's not these massive differences, but I, I don't think from a hypertrophy perspective, there's any negative to adding abandoned chains, maybe not in everything, but you might yeah. get more output from doing that. So from a hypertrophy perspective, it's something that you can definitely experiment with at least and see if you enjoy doing it. Stuff like they use like banded curls and so it can be a little bit tricky to set up, but, but added like a, a banded curl or like, you know, a banded overhead press exercise like these it can be difficult to set up but you might get like a small hypertrophy effect and if anything it would be novel um so if you've not done it for a while from a hypertrophy perspective that could be a benefit uh but we're all in agreement that from like a speed and power perspective it, it's safer um you produce more speed and force and it's yeah specific to the joint angles that you're training that are required in those explosive movements so i think we're in agreement Fantastic, excellent. And don't forget, one more thing we didn't cover is putting a chain around your neck when you're doing pull-ups or dips. Dips. Max dips. likes that one, doesn't he? Max likes uh, putting the chain around his neck. Looks pretty cool. Um, no, absolutely. I think we're in agreement there. I think that was a good, uh, good discussion. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, nothing really more to, to add there, guys. I think, you know, we've got two, two subjects there. We've gone through. Um, hopefully that's given you a better insight into whether you'd prefer to use the trap bar deadlift or conventional deadlift. Um, you know, as with, as with most things, the, again, to, to, to coin a phrase, the devil's in the details there in terms of, you know, understanding the context of what you're after. Um, and obviously accommodating resistance as well, bands and chains. I think, you know, hopefully that's cleared up a few things. If you're a power lifter, you know, and you've seen West Side Barbell type stuff and Louis, you know, Louis Simmons obviously popularizing that over the years. Um, you know, you maybe you've got a better idea now of of why he's doing it and why it might, you know, very much suit his athletes. Um and is you know, the results he's had in in, in um equip powerlifting's, you know, is is there to you know to, to prove to prove it. But it's such a different thing from equipped to non equipped. Um, there's a reason you don't see it much nowadays in like the classic side of powerlifting like I can't yeah. think of anyone that does you see the occasional chain score but it's not like that's not the reason why they're winning the world championships or or, or being first in Britain no one's doing it and that being the reason in classic powerlifting absolutely um, and we've you know perhaps learned there as well that from a you know <clears throat> again it's complex isn't it you know bands and chains from a powerlifting perspective um yes for equipped no for non-equipped from a field sport can be a good teaching pool yeah um, yeah absolutely and from a field uh, athlete point of view they can be very useful um and although the data would you know there is some data to suggest it can help top end strength as well i'm very much a fan personally of mid-range you know improving you know rate of force development through you know mid you know mid-range uh, forces uh, mid-range weight sorry uh, percentages so moving submaximal load very very quickly i think bands and chains have got definitely got a place and uh, are very useful make sure you've got a good enough strength base uh, first um and for general pop yeah absolutely you know absolutely can you know can, can serve a purpose in the in the right context as well um so fantastic uh, i think we'll we'll round round that up there as always um our all our podcasts uh, are on YouTube. We're also on Spotify now, of course, as well. If you just type in MSC Performance, you'll uh, you'll find us on there. If you don't want to see our faces but want to listen to the chat, um, which I wouldn't, wouldn't blame you. Uh, if you want to see our faces, um, then check us out on YouTube. Um, thank you very much, guys. And thank you, Luke, for, for joining me. Thank you, Mark. Over and out, guys. Cheers. <laughs>